I'm Michael Dickinson. I'm a haematologist at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Royal Melbourne Hospital. I'm also the disease group lead for aggressive lymphoma. CAR-T stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. This is a designer immune system and essentially it's custom made for every patient. Essentially what lymphocytes are is a branch of the immune system that exists in every patient and T lymphocytes go around the body hunting for abnormal cells and removing them. So as part of our normal defence from cancers and infection, these T cells go around uh, doing this cell killing action. And what CAR T cells do is they harness that ability of T cells to kill other cells, but reprogram them to deliberately kill the cancer. The process is fairly complicated from a manufacturing point of view. And as I mentioned, it's custom made for every single patient. Here in Australia, the most common process is something called autologous CAR T cells, which means that the lymphocytes that we use to manufacture CAR Ts come from the patient themselves. There are, in clinical trials, allogeneic CAR T cells, which is where the T cells come from another patient, but that's only really very early in development at the moment and not routinely available. So an important part of understanding CAR Ts is knowing that at the moment, CAR T cells that we use come from the patient themselves. So to develop CAR Ts, what we do is we harvest CAR Ts from the patient using an apheresis procedure, which feels a bit like giving blood, but involves having, um, uh, being attached to a machine through two lines, and we take some blood and centrifuge off the lymphocytes that we're interested in and give the rest of the blood back. For patients who've had stem cell collection, the experience is very similar but it needs to be done in a specialised centre that's used to doing this particular type of procedure. Those cells are then taken and sent to a manufacturing facility, which at the moment is usually overseas, but may be in Australia as well. And in the manufacturing facility, alterations are made to the CAR Ts, either through a virus, which reprograms the genes in the CAR T, or through other mechanisms to reprogram the genes in, CAR -T, in the CAR Ts. These new cells, which are basically targeted cells to kill the cancer, are grown up into the lab into a dose that's sufficient for the patient. Uh, they're then uh, stored until the patient is ready to receive them. We condition the patient with a small round of chemotherapy. Fludarabine and cyclophosphamide is the most common treatment. And that's basically about reducing the other lymphocytes that might get in the way of engraftment and activity of these CAR T cells. And so that's given just over a couple of days, usually three days in the week before CAR T cells are given. CAR Ts are then given as a single dose, often about you know, fewer than 15 mils of product, are given to a patient over a short period of time as a single infusion. Our usual process then is to watch a patient very closely while these CAR Ts do their job. And essentially what the job is, is that as soon as the CAR Ts see their target, they expand, multiply, and kill the target. So if they've been properly reprogrammed to kill the cancer, they should kill the cancer and any other cell that's bearing the target. In the case of CAR Ts in Australia and the CAR Ts that are currently approved, that target is CD19, and so CD19 positive tumours are, uh, are, are the things that are the focus of that particular product. But CAR Ts can be applied to a whole range of other targets and there are over, over 160 different types of CAR T cells currently in development across a whole range of different types of cancer. So the term CAR T does not refer to just one thing. In Australia, we've used the term commonly to refer to the recently approved CAR Ts, but actually it's a platform technology that can be harnessed to target different types of cancers. You have to be aware that our application of CAR Ts uh, needs to be done with an evidence base which means that we need trials for each individual target to know that the CAR Ts work and are effective for a particular cancer. And our broadest experience is in CD19 positive tumours, diffuse B cell lymphoma, and acute lymphoblastic leukaemia up to the age of 25. Because CAR T cells are a designer uh, part of the immune system, there is a process of giving a small amount of chemotherapy prior to delivering these cells. The chemotherapy that's typically used is called FC or fludarabine cyclophosphamide 
which is a low dose outpatient treatment that's usually extremely well tolerated and in other contexts is commonly used as a treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. But the difference is we only give it over a couple of days rather than several cycles of treatment and it's usually given a couple of days or about a week prior to the CAR T cells. Because CAR T cells are basically designer lymphocytes designed to kill the tumour, um, they have side effects that are related to how they work, which means that when they see the cancer, they expand, and in the process of expanding, they release hormones which can be similar to the sorts of things that drive our symptoms of infection. So the most common side effect of CAR T cells is fever. That can become more severe, so fever, fast heart rate, low blood pressure, uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, all the symptoms of a severe uncontrolled infection. And so for that reason, uh, CAR T cells need to be given in a centre that's used to responding to these side effects. So there's a whole range of, of this syndrome, it's called cytokine release syndrome that patients can experience. Anything from a fever alone to something requiring an intensive care visit with short-term support in the intensive care while supportive care is given to manage these side effects. The other key side effect is a neurological complication. So it's possible during the treatment of CAR T cells for patients to develop uh, confusion and sometimes very severe confusion uh, that requires special one-on-one -on -one care and special investigation to look for other potential causes. That occurs uh, more commonly for some types of CAR Ts than other types of CAR T and it's an important side effect that we discuss with all of our patients who are receiving CAR Ts. Both of these types of side effects are usually mild but they can be severe and for this reason we need to make sure that patients who receive CAR T cells are fit enough to be able to tolerate the worst case scenario. We certainly know that it is a disaster if these short-term side effects lead to long-term complications. So when we're thinking about how we talk to patients about CAR Ts and which patients CAR, CAR Ts might be useful for, thinking about the um, worst case scenario for these uh, toxicities is a useful way for us to at least frame the discussion. Different hospitals will vary on whether or not they admit patients after CAR Ts. And usually, most of the time, patients will be admitted electively for monitoring of CAR Ts. For certain types of CAR T therapy and in certain clinical trials, admissions are mandatory. And usually, mandatory admission would be less than one week. And so if a patient hasn't developed side effects over the first week of therapy, then discharge is possible but regular follow-up and remaining close to the hospital for the first month is required in all cases. There are some situations where we manage patients completely as outpatients, but this we usually limit to the sorts of CAR Ts where we have the most clinical data and the most clinical trial data to support uh, that we can do that. Uh, and we make it very clear to all of our patients that if we're going to do CAR T treatment, we need to make sure that there are people around you you don't go home by yourself, that you have people around you, particularly during the high risk period of the first week and then the first uh, 28 days after the CAR T cell infusion. I've talked about the short term side effects of CAR Ts, which is cytokine release syndrome, where the peak risk is usually in the first week after treatment, but continues up to the first month after treatment. There are rare cases where it can go beyond that. And I've also talked a little bit about the range of neurological complications that can occur after CAR Ts. Once patients are through that short period of a month or so of careful observation, usually they're back and well. And assuming the cancer is responding, which isn't the case all of the time, uh, then patients usually recover very good health. CAR Ts are an attractive treatment because once you're through that side effect period, there are very few long-term side effects. CD19, which is the target of CAR T cells that are in common use in Australia, uh, is also expressed on normal B cells, which means that B cell depletion or loss of your normal B cells as a consequence of an on-target effect of the CAR Ts 
is an expected and common complication. B cells are an important part of our immune system and of course we're treating B cell cancers here which is, which is why this occurs. B cell depletion can lead to reduced production of antibodies and so it's quite common that patients who've received CAR T's, in fact most patients who've received CAR T's, will make fewer of their own antibodies for quite some period of time and in a small number of patients that can lead well, at least in a, in a significant minority of patients and certainly um, a, a significant number of patients that can lead to a uh, increased risk of common infections such as sinus infections and chest infections and skin infections. And where those infections become serious, then uh, sometimes patients require donor antibodies. So that's called intravenous immunoglobulin, which is for all intents and purposes uh, like a drug in the way it's given. It comes in a powdered form, uh, it's uh, then uh, diluted and, and, and given to a patient usually once a month. And this is manufactured from blood donors where we take a pool of blood donors and get their, um, their antibody containing plasma, treat it to remove any viruses or any kind of infectious compound, turn it essentially into a drug and then give it to patients who are getting infections because they're less able to fight infection. Now, practically, in adults, uh, just having a low immunoglobulin level doesn't mean that you need to have your immunoglobulins replaced. Um, the, there are pretty strict guidelines in Australia for who gets immunoglobulins, and um, my, per my personal approach is not to routinely replace them unless there's clear evidence that a patient is suffering recurrent infection uh, from that. In the paediatric setting, uh, immunoglobulin appears to be more commonly given in, in the international setting and there's limited experience so far to know how Australian doctors will use immunoglobulin. But that monthly visit uh, can occur and does commonly occur uh, after CAR T therapy but certainly not universally and most patients find that uh, really uh, a minor inconvenience um, uh, uh, from a practical point of view and tolerate it very well. Um, some patients in that context may need antibiotics uh, in a chronic way to prevent infection, although this is not a problem that I've seen myself 